thank you, thank you, everyone, for coming back. Um, I uh, oh, there's that. Uh, okay. So today, I want to um, go through in a more explicit way some of the theory I talked about last time. And today's lecture is going to be kind of computational. And uh, then tomorrow, I'm going to go through the theory again. Can you still hear? Am I coming out? So today, can you hear me? It's not working. It is? Now it is. OK, so today is going to be somewhat computational in nature. And then tomorrow, I'm going to reinterpret these computations in terms of um, a conceptual and uh, worthy uh, geometric picture. So I have to warn you, um, there's a whole bunch of people here in a class I'm currently teaching that also involves a lot of computations. And I'm pretty terrible at doing computations on my feet, no matter how much I've prepared them in advance. Um, I eventually get them right. So there's a chance that uh, um, there will be some little mistakes. So what is it they say? Don't listen to my, what is it? Anyway, take me, don't take me, take me seriously, but not literally. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's, that's where we are. So, um, so I want to start um, with an example. So last time we talked about a formal group looking at its universal deformation and asking how the automorphism group of the formal group acts on the universal deformation. And to set the stage uh, and to motivate some of the other questions, let's start with the example where our formal group is the multiplicative formal group um, whose formal sum is given by x plus y minus xy. And secretly, uh, well, secretly that's 1 minus 1 minus x times 1 minus y. It's just multiplication written in a convenient way. And it'll, the reason for this choice of sign convention will come up a little bit, a little bit later. Now, um, I'm over, let's say, z mod p. And what is the automorphism group of the multiplicative formal group? Well, let's, I'm just going to tell you what's a reasonable guess right now, and a little bit later in the lecture we'll actually verify it. But a reasonable guess is that I just, I mean, I'm secretly just multiplying things, so I should just raise those things to a power. And in this case, the automorphism group of the multiplicative group is the group of p-adic units, and lambda in the p-adic units acts on this by sending x to 1 minus 1 minus x to the lambda, where I'm supposed to interpret that by just expanding it out using the binomial theorem and observing that all of those binomial coefficients, uh, well, they form a power series. OK. And what's the Lubin-Tate universal deformation? So the Lubin-Tate ring, in this case, The Lubin-Tate ring in this case is just um, the, the p-adic numbers itself. Remember, there's n minus 1 deformation parameters, and this was height 1. And so I have some ring action of the p-adic units on the p-adic numbers, but that's generated by one element. It has to act trivially. So ought gamma acts trivially. OK. Now, um, so that's great. And we could calculate the cohomology of the group of p-adic units on something. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about doing that in just a minute. Um, but this isn't really the whole computation one wants to do. So remember, I had this ring, e, this graded ring. And topologists evenly grade this ring, where E0 was the Lubin-Tate deformation ring. But um, the, the graded ring had uh, 
Ah, sorry. It had, um, it had a parameter like that where you think of U as an invariant differential on the group or a differential at the identity. And so I want to just sort of, because I'm about to get into some kind of explicit calculations, I want to just warm up and get everybody on the same page with this, with, with this setup. So in our case, we really want to look at the ring ZP adjoin U and U inverse. And I want to figure out how lambda in the automorphism group of the multiplicative group, which is a p-adic unit, how does that act on U? OK, well, um, the way this works is U inverse is an invariant differential on the multiplicative group. That means that U inverse looks like, looks like dx plus higher terms. And the higher terms are rigged so that when I translate by an element in the multiplicative group, I get the same differential back again. And in fact, if you work it out, um, which I hope I did, I get that it's 1 minus x dx. OK. <clears throat> and now, um, if you check, um, Obviously, so I don't really have to work with this differential. I, I just have to check the value at the identity. It's automatically, um, it's automatically uh, translation invariant. So if I, if I take 1 minus 1 minus x to the lambda, that's going to be lambda x plus higher terms. And so I find that u inverse goes to lambda times u inverse. OK, now. If anybody in here is an algebraic topologist, which many people are, including me, um, you're going to realize this already doesn't look very good because lambda is supposed to act on u by multiplication by lambda. And I'm just saying this because um, there's an enormous number of conventions that you have to get into place here. And um, I think I've remembered them all, uh, but it's possible that I didn't. And um, so, uh, and, and this is the first in indication where you have to be a little bit careful. So, you have to be careful, it's sort of annoying, but you have to be careful about whether you've decided that the automorphism group of gamma acts on the left of this ring or on the right. And um, when you set it up, in some of the formulas naturally give you a right action, and then when you want to write them as a left action, you have to multiply by the inverse you have to take the inverse and act on the, on the other side. So that happens here. I'm going to just ignore it in this case, and then we will um, come back. Um, but this, is gonna, this might disagree with some things people know. But I'm just going to warn you that there's a little bit of uh, f funny business about, you have to be careful. You have to set things up carefully about which side the automorphism group is acting. So, so in topology, this is, usually, this is usually acting on the other side. OK. So, so let's go on. So I'm going to choose a, uh, so now I want to compute the, uh, the cohomology of this whole ring, right? So I want to compute the cohomology of the p-adic units on um, this ring. or on each individual power of u. And um, for the p-adic units, um, we can just choose. That's topologically generated. Let's suppose p is greater than 2. Uh, the p-adic units is topologically generated by one element. So we can write it as the p minus first roots of unity cross the uh, elements congruent to 1 mod p. And by choosing a generator for the p minus first root of unity and for the elements of 1 mod p, we can get a single topological generator. So let me let lambda, 
So let's let, actually, just because of this, let me write lambda inverse as, uh, well, that'll just be any element that's not congruent, that's, that is, um, uh, so this is some element that generates Z mod P cross mod P, and I want lambda to, to the inverse to the P minus one to be uh, uh, congruent to, so that'll be one mod P, but I want it not congruent to one mod P squared. So don't worry about that. This is just a single topological generator. And then the copy of, so then the cohomology with coefficients in this u plus or minus one, let me just write it like this, the cohomology of, with coefficients in u to the n zp is zp, sorry, the p-adic numbers modulo uh, lambda to the n minus one at least when n, I'm sorry, h1, h0 is 0. Uh, this is at least when n is not equal to 0. Okay, now, um, I was going to spend some time lingering over this, uh, but I just want to indicate that um, this num the value of these groups, if you start working, if you start playing with these, you'll find that if n1 and n2 are close, p-adically, then these groups are close p-adically. And, um, and in fact, there's a way of p-adically interpolating these groups. Another way of saying it is that this formula makes sense for, instead of lambda to the n, uh, um, for this map, that can be any element um, that's a homomorphism from the p-adic units into the p-adic units. So, and in fact, it's useful to do that because it's useful to understand this family of groups as a p-adically continuous family of groups. So if you're if you're in number theory and you've studied uh, Iwasawa theory, this is something familiar to you. And this question I raised the first day about equivariant line bundles over the Lubin-Tate space, that's, that has to do with trying to have an Iwasawa type picture for the cohomology of these groups Sn. So anyway, in this simple example, I just wanted to indicate the reason, one of the reasons that question was on the table. And I'll try and come back to that a little bit later. Okay, anyway, let's regard this computation as having been extraordinarily successful. And inspired by that, we want to move on and try to do the case n equals 2. <clears throat> okay, so we know the Lubin-Tate ring. So we want to compute, um, so gamma 2, gamma will be our formal group of height 2. K will be some algebraically closed field of the field with, of FP, and W will be the width vectors of K, and we have this formal power series ring here, and we want to figure out what is the cohomology of gamma acting on this. Okay, now there's some problems in doing this right away. One problem is uh, I'm sorry, thank you. Somebody muttered that under their breath, but um, they sh it would be better if you muttered it out loud. I meant to say ot gamma. Thank you. What's the cohomology of ot gamma with coefficients in this ring? Well, there's a problem right away. Uh, one is, I don't know what ot gamma is. For that matter, I don't really know what gamma is. And even if I did know what it was, I wouldn't know how it was acting on this ring. So before we can even begin to attack this problem, we need to, um, we need to figure out what aught gamma is, and we need to figure out how aught gamma acts on this ring. Now, <clears throat> before I do that, I'm going to tell you an amazing thing, and that is that we know the answer to this. And I described this last time, 
But let me just tell you what it turns out. So again, so now P is going to be greater than 3, but that the cohomology, this map, so this is just aught gamma is acting trivially on W. That's it's inside this. And um, this is an isomorphism, and this is an exterior algebra on a class in degree one and a class in degree three. So this looks like the cohomology of the, of the group um, uh, uh, U, U2. And, um, and so this is rather amazing that we know this completely. And in fact, if I took the quotient of this by the constant functions, that's a module that has no invariance and no cohomology. And it would be really fantastic to have a conceptual explanation of this. So in the projects, as I said, I rec reported in great detail uh, about how this calculation is made, but it's complicated, and um, this, is, this is sort of regarded as an important question in algebraic topology about whether, why this is true, sort of if, from a conceptual reason, and, and how one might approach this, uh, if it's true in higher height. Okay, all right, so I want to address these things, um, and I hope I've got this right. So the first thing I need to do in order to address this is to, some, in some way or another, tell you what gamma is and tell you how to compute its automorphisms. So I'm going to do this via, um, so I want to do this via the theory of the Dudin A module. <laughs> And let me just tell you, today is going to be computationally oriented, and so I'm just going to tell you how things work and try and give you some tools for proving that they work this way. But again, uh, my comp as I say, my goal is to, uh, is, to, is to show you some computations, and my ambition, my realistic ambition, is to get them about 90% right. So let's see what we can do. So I want to explain the theory of Dudin-A modules. Okay, so for this, I'm going to suppose K is a perfect field. And um, there's going to be an equivalent. So the category of formal groups um, is equivalent to, over K, of finite dimension, and is equivalent to some other category that's, that's much easier to describe. So, uh, so I'm going to introduce some terminology. So W will be the wit vectors of K. And um, so K has this automorphism, Frobenius. And that lifts uniquely to an automorphism of the Witt vectors, which sends roots of unity to their pth power. So a Dude A module for us will be um, A Dudin A module for us is um, it's a fine, it's a free W module of finite rank, equipped with two operators. So F is a linear map. So, okay, let me just let me write this correctly. So this means F is, a, is, a, is an additive map from M to itself, but it's not W linear. This means that if I multiply um, an element in M by an element in the Witt vectors, the, the action is semilinear. It's also equipped with an operator V, which goes the other direction. And just so I get these all on the same page, F and V satisfy this relation that F V equals V F equals P. So there's some other little 
there's some other assumptions to get this all straight. They're in the notes, but I'm just going to stop. Uh, you need to know that um, M is V adically complete. Um, but I, or, so V is pro nilpotent on M, but I'm not going to worry about that at the moment. Okay, so formal groups are equivalent to a suitable category. So formal groups. over K, that's equivalent to the category of Duden A modules, suitable Duden A modules. And um, so now a formal group had a dimension, which, because it was a formal, I, I only considered one dimensional ones, but I could have considered a formal group structure on the Lie variety of dimension N. And they also have a height. So under this, the dimension, the height corresponds to the dimension over W of M. And the dimension, it's kind of unfortunate here, um, corresponds to the dimension over K of M mod VM. OK. So let's make a guess. We want a formal group of height 2. So our height's supposed to be 2, so we want our module M is supposed to be free of rank 2. And the dimension was 1, so M mod VM has to have dimension 1 over the ground field. So that means there's sort of one obvious thing to write. Let's take M to have, so let me call this an example. We'll take M to have basis gamma and V gamma, darn it. Take M to have basis gamma and V gamma, obviously, uh, and then I'm going to, I have to tell you what F is, and F gamma will be V gamma. Now that tells you the rest of the structure, and this M corresponds to a height n, height 2 formal group over k. And this will be our Lubin-Tate group that we're going to, uh, and the general one, more generally, the height n, more generally, height n, the height n example would have basis uh, gamma, v gamma, up to v to the n minus 1 gamma, and f gamma is v to the n minus 1 gamma. OK, so that's, that's it. In fact, you can prove that um, over, an al over an algebraically closed field of, over a, a perfect field, let's say, over the, uh, let me just say, over the algebraic closure of fp bar, this is it. Any, any Duden A module of finite, you know, of the kind I've defined is, is e equivalent to, is isomorphic to one of these. And once you know the equivalence, and I'm going to tell you how to construct this equivalence, once you know this equivalence between formal groups and Duden A modules, it becomes a problem in semilinear algebra to do this. Okay, so now we have our hands on our formal group, and now what about, so what about ot gamma? Well, let's see. Um, an automorphism of this, so again, I'm back to height 2. So an automorphism of this, what's the most general automorphism? It can send gamma to A gamma plus B V gamma. And now it has to commute with the operations F and V. So V gamma will go to V on this. Now, V is, oh, oh no, shoot. That wasn't a mistake, that dot's not, that, that, the dot's a mistake, that's not supposed to be there. Pretend that never happened. So V gamma is going to have to go to A Frobenius inverse V gamma plus B Frobenius inverse V squared gamma. But remember, remember that F gamma 
was V gamma, so P gamma, which is VF gamma, is V squared gamma. So V squared is P, so this is equal to um, A phi inverse V gamma plus P B phi inverse gamma. So it's a little annoying if you start out the day writing your automorphism like this, you don't wind up with Frobenius, you wind up with the inverse of Frobenius in your formulas. Um, okay, um, but I'm not done, right? I have to check that this satisfied the relations, right? And what was the relation? The relation was that F gamma was V gamma. So where does F gamma go? So that goes to A Frobenius, uh, V gamma plus P B Frobenius gamma. Now, let's see if this works. These are supposed to be equal. So what we learn is that A Frobenius has to be A Frobenius inverse, or in other words, that A and B have to be in the Witt vectors of the field with p squared elements. They can't be arbitrary elements in the Witt vectors. And now, if I've written this out, if I work this out, I've just discovered that aught gamma is the group of matrices of the form, so uh, A, B, and then V gamma went to P, B acted on by this, and this. And since I'm, since A phi was A phi inverse, I could write these as, I could have used Frobenius, not the inverse there, but if you go to work this out in higher height, um, that would mess you up. Where A and B are in the Witt vectors of FP squared. Okay, so now we have a perfectly good explicit uh, way of understanding the automorphism group of gamma, and there's many ways you might recognize this matrix group. Um, it's the group of, it's the maximal order in a certain division algebra, but for our purposes, this matrix representation is awfully good. Okay, <clears throat> now that's great. Um, that's great, that's great. We now understand aught gamma completely. And now I want to understand how does it act on the Lubin Tate ring. And for that, I need, um, I need to tell you about something called the Tapis de Cartier. I wish I knew who gave it this name. But um, Tapis is the French word, I think, for carpet. And so this you're supposed to think of as Cartier's magic carpet. So you climb on Cartier's magic carpet and you, f and you elevate from a formal group in characteristic P to one in characteristic zero. So, so let's do that. Okay. <clears throat> so the tapis de Cartier says that, so let's go back. We have a formal group in, oh, in characteristic P and we want to lift it to the Witt vectors. And the, and the tapis de Cartier gives you a way of doing that entirely in terms of the Dudenay module. So how does this go? Um, so I have the Dudenay module, M, and I can look at M mod Vm. Now M mod Vm has dimension one over K. So let's choose, there's gonna be a lot of uh, artificial choices in this that we're gonna to have to undo later on, but just for the purposes of calculating stuff, let's just, uh, with abandon, make choices. So, uh, so I have, let's choose an isomorphism here. Okay, M mod VM had dimension one because the formal group was dimension one. And the tapis de Cartier says that the, a, ma a map like this, so this is, these are, this is a linear map over the Witt vectors. That corresponds to lifts of our formal group gamma to the Witt vectors. So that's pretty great. Um, all I have to do is uh, 
write down, um, all I have to do is parameterize this space of lifts, give it some coordinates, and I can write down how the automorphism group of gamma acts on this Lubin Tate ring, and we'll be halfway home. Now, um, I want to do a little bit of a quick dimension count, a little reality check. The Lubin Tate deformation space had dimension one, there's one parameter. How many parameters do I have here? M had dimension two. One element goes to something that's one mod P, so it still has a whole, you know, copy of the width vectors to move through. And the other element can go to something arbitrary, so that's two dimensional. So I already have to come to grips with something artificial, something in our choice. And the, the thing is, I can, um, the thing is that I, uh, I want to, I can normalize this, all right? Well, this was, these were isomorphism classes of deformations, and I want to normalize this in a certain way. So let's just be specific, okay? So we had this, we had this specific element gamma in here, and let's suppose this is, so let's go back to our square. This, this sends, let's suppose this is the map sending gamma to one. And I want to consider only W linear lifts that send gamma to one. And this choice, I'll get rid of this choice in, in, in a few minutes, but for now, the tapis de Cartier, at least as far as we are concerned, um, will tell us that the, the lifts of gamma are exactly corresponding to the homomorphisms here that send gamma to one. That's fantastic, okay, so let's make a guess now. Um, I, want to, I want to function this UI, the Lubin Tate deformation parameter is supposed to be a function on this space of lifts. So what function, what's the obvious function? Well, given a lift, I know where gamma goes, I just have to say where V gamma goes. So if I have a lift, I'm gonna call this lift T then we could define U1, all right. I'm gonna call this U1, but like since this is a math lecture, I'm supposed to be telling you the truth. This U1 is not gonna work. So later on, I'm gonna call it W1. Um, but let's, so let's together walk down this erroneous path into ruin and we'll together call this element W1, even, but in the full knowledge that later I'm sorry, U1, and later we're going to call it W1. Okay, so let's guess. Let's guess. Um, we all know that only an idiot would guess this. Let's guess that U1 on T is the value of T on V gamma. Okay? So we might guess that this is our Lubin Tate ring, okay? That's fantastic. The tapis de Cartier told us we, we can now figure out how, um, how our, our matrix element acts on the Lubin Tate ring, which is the formal power series in U1. So let's do it. Let's do it. So what happens? So I have an element, um, I have an element in the Lubin Tate ring, which I'll just write as gamma goes to A gamma plus B. V gamma, and what does that do? So we'll call this, this is an automorphism, let's call it G. So this element here I'll be calling G. And so how, what's G gonna do to U1? Well, um, you know, that's a bit of an issue, right? Because I had this map, when I act by G, I have a new map from M into W, but it doesn't send gamma to one anymore, right? Gamma went to this, and V gamma went to uh, A phi inverse V gamma plus P B phi inverse gamma. So you might think you evaluate T on V gamma, but this, this did not go to one. So if you work this out, you find that G on U1 is this number, A phi inverse U1, uh, 
a plus p b v inverse divided by a, a b u1 plus a. It's acting by fractional linear transformations. That seems awesome. So now we know the group is acting by fractional linear transformations. The group came out in matrices, and we just have to calculate the cohomology. And I have to look at the time. OK. Uh, the crickets are coming, right? What time are the crickets coming? 15 minutes? Oh, geez. OK. Uh-oh. Uh oh, that's bad. OK. I'm not going to, I'm really, well, I might have to leave some of this for the next lecture. So, okay, so this, this is wrong. This formula doesn't work, and, um, but it's a good model formula. And so let me just tell you what, so this is a bit awkward because it was fractional linear. And what I should have been, I should have been, I should have not made this formula. I should have not made this convention. And what happens is that, where this formula is trying, so a fractional linear formula is a ratio of two linear formulas, and the linear formula is really happening in this ring E negative two. So let me just tell you what the crystalline approximation is. The crystalline approximation is this idea, it's not it's not correct in general, but I'm going to show you in a moment how to modify it. The crystalline approximation is supposed to be a map from the due to A module into E negative 2, which is U times this power series ring on U1 up to UN minus 1. And it sends gamma to U, V gamma to U, U1, all the way up to V to the N minus 1 gamma to U u n minus 1. And it's supposed to be aught gamma equivariant. So if you kind of bought into this tapis de Cartier stuff, you would have believed that this, you could do this. And um, the tapis de Cartier almost works, and the way you modify it to make it work leads to some really beautiful, uh, a very beautiful picture of this group action. But let me just say in a couple words, um, so the crystalline approximation is not correct. Um, there's a, I'm going to rename the parameters that make it correct. But let's just notice that this would give us, in closed form, a formula for the action of aught gamma on this ring. Aught gamma is always expressible as some matrix group. And um, these are, up to completion, algebra generators for this ring. And so I would learn that this Lubin-Tate ring is, the, is a suitable completion of a localization of the symmetric algebra on the Dudenne module. Now, there's a cool fact that also, it's a theorem of myself and Doug Ravenel and Mike Hill, that you can always find parameters like this for which the crystalline approximation holds if you restrict your attention, you can't find them for the full automorphism group of gamma, but you can for any finite subgroup whose p Celo subgroup is cyclic. And, um, and that proof starts out with some real pyrotechnics, with crystalline cohomology and all this. In the end, it just turns into a, a knife fight. It's just not... Uh, it's just not uh, pretty by the time the proof is over. And uh, it would be nice to have a conceptual explanation of this. Um, but anyway, this is an important approximation, and it's a very good guideline for thinking about this group action. Okie doke. So I, I don't want to go over time. I left myself an awful lot to say, but let me... Um, let's... Uh, I'm just going to get as much as I can, and then I will move into the to the next, uh, I'll just leave, I'll just let whatever's going to come uh, go into the next talk. Okay, so how do we, so I claim that something went wrong, and I, because, but I was asking you to believe all kinds of things, like the equivalence between dude and modules and formal groups. I was asking you to believe in Cartier's magic carpet, and um, I want to give you some justification for that. So, so first we have to say, how do I actually give you a formal group? 
And the most convenient way to do that is the following. I'm going to start, I want to give you a formal group over K, but I'm really going to give you a formal group over the ring of width vectors, but I'm not going to give it to you there. I'm going to give it to you over Q tensor the ring of width vectors. And in, in, in reality, this is any ring in characteristic P. This is any torsion-free ring, and here it is embedded in its rationals. And over this ring, over a Q algebra, any formal group is isomorphic to the additive formal group. Um, and there's a simple way to do this. It's explained in the notes, but you, you integrate the invariant differential. So, so let me just say this. I have some formal group gamma. I'm going to lift it to G. And over here, I have an isomorphism of G with the additive group. And that isomorphism is called the log of G, which will be a lot more convenient if I write it as F of X. And that will be X plus higher terms. And that's a formal power series over this ring. And my formal group, and it, it, so that has rational coefficients, but F inverse of F of X plus F of Y is X formal sum G Y. Now, one, I can finally deliver on one promise. I had all these weird negative signs in the multiplicative group. But if you work out the log of the multiplicative group with the conventions I gave you, that's just the sum of x to the n over n. All right, that's minus log of 1 minus x. And so that's why those signs are in there, so that there's no signs here. OK. <clears throat> so how does the tapis de Cartier work? You know, I sort of, all right, I'm going to do something unprofessional. Uh, I'm just going to, oh no, all right, I can write it here. So here's a cool formula. I give you the tapis de Cartier, right? I want to tell you how to go from something like this to the log of a formal group. And then, if I've done that, I've actually told you how to go back from a Dudenne module to a formal group, because given any Dudenne module, you can write this function down. You can just choose a T use my formula to get the log of a formal group, and I have given you a functor back from Dudenne modules to formal groups. And the, um, and the way you do it, so given T, the log is, um, you, you show that F of X, which is going to be the sum of T on F to the N gamma, x to the p to the n over p to the n is the log of, the, of a formal group. So this is a great formula. This is an extremely useful formula. And let's just do a couple of examples. So here's one example. Let's take G to be the multiplicative group. And in that case, the Dudenne module has dimension 1. And uh, it, it's free of rank, sorry, it's free of dimension 1. And V has to be topologically nilpotent. And FV is P. So the only, only way I can do this is to say that v F gamma is gamma. And in that case, I find that the log is the sum of x to the p to the n over p to the n. Now that looks bad because the log here was the sum of x to the n over n, and here I had only the p power terms. But it's a cool fact, I actually wrote down a proof in the notes, that if you have the log of a formal group over a p local ring, you can just throw away the terms that aren't p powers of x, and you'll still get the log of a formal group. So in practice, you, you want the log to have as few of terms as you can, and you, you only look at the ones where, you, you just only look at ones that only have p power terms, like in my formula. And so, um, and if you know about, you know, this is the, in this case, this is the theory of the Art and Hasse exponential. What's that? We're using B to span the Dudenne module before, and now you're using F to span it? 
No, uh, that's just the formula. The formula involves f, not v. Uh, in the case of height 2, it, since f is v, you wouldn't have gotten the difference, but um, yeah, the formula involves the Frobenius. Okay. Uh, so what about, let's do another example. Let's do an example of height 2. So in height 2, uh, I need to pick one of these t's. So let's suppose t of gamma is 1 and t of v gamma is 0. Then you would find that your log is the sum of x to the p to the 2n over p to the n. Because when I apply f, I get v gamma, and t will kill it. When I apply f again, that'll multiply by p. So I'll only see the even powers, and, they'll have, and the 2nth and the power will be multiplied by p to the n. So this is a very common formula, and I'll call this L of x. And now, um, and so this is the log of the Lubin Tate group, um, and there's, uh, and, and you can get it actually from Lubin Tate's original construction. And I just want to go back to, uh, let's try to write down our universal one, okay? So let's do the one, so now I am going to call this W instead of U1. So I'm going to call this parameter W, and let's try to work over the width vectors adjoin W. W1, and I'm going to define my map T by T of gamma is 1, and T of V gamma is W1. And then I want to know what's the log of the new formal group. And what you find is that the log is L of x, the original L of x, plus W1 over P L of x to the p. And if you look at the coefficient of x to the p, when you, uh, or, so this, if you, an elementary exercise shows that f inverse of x, of f of x plus f of y does not have coefficients. in this ring. So that's the problem. That's why the Tapie de Cartier story doesn't quite work. And in fact, we'll see in a, a little bit that in fact it does have coefficients in the divided power completion And that just means formal sums of the thing that look like w1 to the n over n factorial. Um, okay. So now I'm in an incredibly awkward position. So now, according to my calculations, there are five minutes until it's crickets. Uh, like two. two. Okay. Oh, this is perfect. Okay. So. The next thing I need to tell you about is a, a, a famously complicated formula called Hazewinkel's functional equation lemma. Hazewinkel starts his book with the functional equation lemma, whose statement begins on page 8 with the setup. The setup ends on page 9, and the theorem is finally stated on page 10. I'm going to explain the Hasewinkel functional equation lemma to you. Obviously, I'm not going to do it in the remaining two minutes minus x, so it's going to happen next time. But it's famously hard to, uh, to explain, and I managed to digest it, and uh, at great personal cost, I'm going to explain it to you. <laughs> so why was this great personal cost? Well, I was sitting in a bar, like, preparing these lectures, and I said, all right, I better come to grips with this functional equation lemma. And you know, what's happening is you're, this is your brain, right? And you're trying to process it. You're trying to hold the setup in your main brain. And all of a sudden, it's just like, you, you know, you can't go any further. And I hit that point, and I look up, and there's a guy drinking a martini, and his arm just stops. And I'm thinking, glad I'm not that guy. And then I look around the bar, 
And everybody is stopped. And this man comes walking in the room and he goes, do you know who I am? And I said, I don't know, Louis Cipher, Snuffleupagus, I don't know. And he says, that doesn't matter. You want to understand that equation, functional equation lemma, don't you? I said, yes. And he said, all you have to do is give up a memory and then I'll let you understand it. <laughs> So I started thinking of all these memories, like when I was a kid eating Bazooka Joe bubblegum and I look at the little comic in it and there's an ad for the Palisades Amusement Park and I realize the whole world is just governed by corporate influence. And, uh, <laughs> but then I decided, you know, that's maybe not, it's a good memory to have. And then I had this brilliant idea. I go, I know what memory I want to give up. This stupid memory of you coming in here and making me this deal, I just, I don't even want to know about that. And so he goes, okay. And then he walks away, and then like the tape gets longer. I understand Hazewinkel's functional equation lemma, and I'm walking thinking, great, he forgot to take away the memory. It's a freebie. So, um, so why is this coming at a great personal cost? Well, I realized later that the joke was on me. See, now that you know this can happen, how do you know this doesn't happen all the time, <laughs> right? How do you know that like every time you learn something and then like two hours later you go, oh, I finally get it, that there wasn't some deal that you made where you had this clever idea to give up this BS memory and forget this stuff. So my life now has an enormous number of, of holes in it um, and that's the great personal cost uh, and that's the next time you're going to hear about functional... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, questions? <laughs> what bar? <laughs> I forget. <laughs> so, I for the, <laughs> so for the more general setup of modeling the action via a due to name module, is there any reason why you chose the covariant uh, story with the Vershebung instead of the Ferbenian. Yeah, and, um, and in the next lecture, the contravariant version is going to come, but that's because it's the covariant version that most directly maps into the Lubin Tate ring, and the contravariant version it winds up receiving a map. I, it'll, it should come clear in the next lecture, but um, it, it's, because of, it's because it has the most direct connection to the, to the Lubin Tate ring itself. Other questions? Okay, uh, let's thank Mike again and uh, adjourn for lunch. <laughs>